We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Folks, on the phone, it is a pleasure to welcome the 19th and current chair of the Libertarian National Committee, Nicholas Sarwak. Nick, uh, Nicholas, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on, Sam. Uh, so, all right, just will you just tell folks what does what do you do as the chair of the Libertarian National Committee? Are you like the party head? Yeah, I, um, it's the same position as the chairs of the Republican or Democratic National Committees. So. You're the chair of the national organization of the party that controls, you know, um, the national finances, has a national headquarters, coordinates ballot access, party stuff. Okay. And so um, now, all right, so let's get some of the, uh, the mechanics out of the way here. If I was to run in the libertarian primary, what, what, how would I go about doing that? Is it too late? Well, uh, it's not too late. We nominate by convention still. So libertarian politics is still real and not as made up and kabuki as the two old parties. Mm -hmm. So you would have to go around to state conventions uh, all around the country. We're organized in all 50 states and convince people who are going to be delegates to our national convention held next May in Austin to vote for you at that convention. We don't do binding primaries in um in the various states those are just advisory you know or beauty contests could i uh could i uh, lobby um these potential delegates you know by phone by mail uh in other forums yeah i mean it's standard political campaigning the only difference is you're not trying to get votes on a state-sponsored primary election day you're trying to convince activists who are going to be delegates to the national convention that you would be the best standard bearer for the Libertarian Party in 2020. Are we? Uh, are there going to be debates? There are debates already happening uh, among the candidates who are seeking the nomination. Usually those are at uh, state party conventions around the country. There are some online debates that have happened. One of the things that I've noticed is everybody's really focused on the 37 people who are running for the democratic nomination right now. So that's eating a lot of the oxygen in the room. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry about that. by all means, send, send the, if you have video of the debates, send them to us because I'm, I'm upset that we have not seen them. Um, who, who has been debating? Who are some of the, who are some of the top libertarian candidates at the moment? Is Kokesh in there? So right now, Kokesh is in there. Um, there's Adam Kokesh, there's Arvind Vora, there's Kim Ruff, there's Berman Supreme, um, Daniel Taxation is Theft Berman, and then there's a number of other people who are rumored to be considering running and haven't decided to run yet because we are still, Early. you know, almost a year out from the convention in, in Austin. Okay. All right. So uh, we've got those mechanics down. I'm not sure. What do you think my chances would be in the, um, I mean, to, to run if I was going to run? Uh, you know, every time we have a national convention, the delegates are going to balance between who is closest to the libertarian platform and, you know, in their beliefs and who is likely to have the largest megaphone, uh, if they go out and get the most credibility and earn the most votes. So where do you fall on how much of the libertarian platform you agree with? Well, I, that's the thing I wanted to talk to you about. Um, because I'm not sure I'm fully aware of what the uh, platform is, but to the extent that I am aware of it, I have a feeling not much. Now, um, I wanted to talk to you about that how... That might be a tough, tough run for you. Well, but I also, I got to say, I mean, as popular as Vermin Supreme is, I may have a bigger platform, right? I mean, I could probably, yep. I could probably get on MSNBC as a libertarian candidate in a way that, you know, I understand Gary Johnson had that, but I, so far I don't see any big names out there who are going to be able to do this. Yeah. I mean, the, the field is fairly open right now, but you know, the question is going to be, why should a libertarian delegate want you up on that stage? If what you're going to say is, well, I don't really agree with my party on anything. Um, but look at me, I'm on TV. All right. Well, 
sell sell that for uh, for my delegates. Fair enough, but you got to give me some credit, uh, Nicholas, because I'm not gonna. That's the way the way I'm gonna approach it. I'm gonna try and okay. convince the uh, the folks in the party that that there's some policies that need to be changed, like probably most of them. Now, I, I think like on a, on a foreign policy perspective, I think we're fairly close, fairly close. I'm not okay. sure, like, you know, at least at least top line, it looks like we're close. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm for... Uh, you don't support foreign wars and I know, don't getting involved in other countries, civil wars, bombing Yemen, in, things like that. Indeed, indeed. So I think we've got, okay. um, we're, we're aligned there. Um, I think on right. um, decriminalization and uh, legalization of, uh, of drugs, I think we're, we're fairly aligned, I'm guessing. I don't know. So if, you're not, you don't want to keep the racist war on drugs going. That's you want to stop that. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, so we're good on those two. We got two. Now it gets a little trickier. Um, where are you guys on single payer health care? Do you think the government has been really good at doing things efficiently with your money? Yes. <laughs> okay. Relative All to right. like, like rel relative to what? Like Verizon? Um, I mean, what's the, what do you see as the quality of the single payer systems that we have now? Um, either the VA, Medicare, Medicaid, do those produce high quality health care? Uh, the VA is actually not just a single payer. VA is actually full on socialized medicine, right? that we provide right. How's that going? it's going actually if you look at um if you look at the surveys of people who use the va uh in the terms who didn't kill themselves that's that's right that's right there's a lot of people who come back from wars and have ptsd that's why if we go back to the first plank that we agree upon we don't well, that's another mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we don't want to send people to war i mean you know right, right that the people who get treated by the va have the single are, are, are the singularly most um, um, uh, most complicated cohort of people to treat because they are sustaining injuries that doctors and um, uh, who are civilian doctors who just don't come across they just don't have any experience in it medicine medicine for people who have gone through war is a radically different uh, animal in many respects and so it is. Um, the VA, if you look at satisfaction surveys of the VA, overall, they're competitive, if not better, than private hospitals. A, a if you look at uh, polling on Medicare, people love Medicare. They love it. And well, people on Medicaid actually love polling. it, but they don't. I asked about how it works. Well, how would you assess how it works beyond whether the patients are happy with it? Uh, cost for outcomes is usually oh, the way that most great. policy I've seen works. Well, then you know that Medicaid costs almost 20 cents less a dollar than mm -hmm. private insurance does in terms of delivering the exact same services. And then, in fact, you also probably know that when private insurance decides on, on trying to figure out what is the most effective treatment for different things and what they'll cover, they look to Medicare for that data because Medicare is the only one that collects all that data and has enough of a, of a, of a pool in which to assess it. So by both those measures, Medicare is doing great. That, uh, that does not comport with the lived experience of Medicare recipients, but... Wait, I thought we just you know, said... If, if you wanted wait, to wait, talk wait. about polling, that's fine. When you say comport with the lived experience of Medicare recipients, wouldn't we be able to use polls to judge their satisfaction levels? And we started with that. That's the first thing I told you, and you said that wasn't good. Well, no, you, you would use patient surveys of how they feel about the treatment they receive, not how the general public feels about Medicare as an abstract program. I'm talking about Medicare in terms of the people who are on Medicare. All the polling of people mm -hmm. who are on Medicare give it high marks. Now, that doesn't necessarily okay. have to do with the treatment because the treatment they're getting from private doctors. Medicare is just the insurance. Okay. You know that, right? Right. Right. So 
I think I could go in and sell people on the idea that a single payer health care system is the way we should go. Medicare for all. And in fact, the Medicare for all that um, uh, that Bernie, for instance, is offering is actually even better and is, I think, going to be appreciated by people even more than the Medicare that exists now. Okay. How would that work with the $22 trillion debt that we have? I don't know. How does the tax cuts work with the debt? How does our military Pretty budget poorly. work with the debt? When you don't cut spending, and neither the Republicans nor Democrats have any interest in cutting spending, and you continue to spend more than you take in in tax receipts, yeah. uh, it doesn't really work. Why? What's not working? I mean, we're putting our children and grandchildren into debt. Um, why? Is that sustainable? Yes. It okay. is sustainable. How, how fact, do you sustain that? Well, I mean, it's easy. Um, the debt, we're a sovereign nation. We can print our own currency. Okay. Uh, the debt that we owe is really just to ourselves. We, d- we gave trillions of dollars to the banks. I didn't agree with it, but we did it. Trillions of dollars to the banks, mm-hmm. and we just wiped it off the balance sheets. It's gone. Okay. Okay. So what happens when... Uh, we just print our way out of this. What does that What does that look like to you? Well, we wouldn't necessarily print our way out of it. We would just erase the debt. But to the extent that we print our way out okay. of it, so we, you we cannot have. On our debt. What you, hap- you're worried what about goes, inflation. What happens then? You're worried about inflation. And if do you the, have an example of another country that's defaulted on its sovereign debt, and what happened to them? We're not going to default on our sovereign debt. Okay. Well, we owe it okay. to ourselves. We're not going to default. We well, just, we don't owe we just, it to ourselves. The, we have bondholders that hold treasury notes that are separate from the I understand. Government. The vast majority of those okay. are owned by the U.S. government. Uh, I thought the majority was owned by China, but... Really? Let's assume, Let's look that up. I'm hold pretty on. sure China is the holder of most of our sovereign debt. Really? Come on now. You're the chairman yeah. of, a, of a major, major U.S. policy. Matt, would you put a, would you Google for us... Who owns U.S. debt? Put it up there. I would say China, the last I recall, was somewhere, I don't know, around uh, maybe 9%, 10%. Uh, Foreign investors own 30%. U.S. government owns 30%. 30%. Wait, what's that? Roll up there. Federal Reserve owns 11%. U.S. investors own 30%. So we have China assuming... Assuming Trooper. China is the biggest holder of our debt, uh, mm. uh, it's not going to be more than like 10, 15%. So the 30%, okay. the 5.73 trillion held by the U.S. government, well, guess what? Mm-hmm. U.S. government's going to be fine. We can, uh, we can print our own money, so we don't need the money that we owe ourselves. We've borrowed. Okay. How, how did that work for Argentina or Venezuela? How did, how did what did? How did what work for Argentina and Venezuela? Well, Venezuela inflating your way out of your sovereign Well, we're not debt inflating our way out of sovereign debt. On it. We're, not, we're not inflating our way out of it. We can just write it off. Okay. You're not comparing the economy of Venezuela to the economy of the United States, are you? No, I'm asking you the question. What, where what would Venezuela fit in the United States? Policy? Which one of the what states? What do you think is the outcome that we get if we print our way out of I've it? I've already told you what the outcome way is. Out of it or default on Nicholas, it. What happens to Nicholas, the country I told and the you. people who live here? Nicholas, I told you what happens. Nothing. What happens? Nothing. Okay. Um, do you have any examples of someone else where they did this and I, nothing yes. bad happened? The United States, quantitative easing. I want everybody who thinks that what I'm talking about is not uh, accurate and what Nicholas is saying is accurate to Google QE1, 2, and 3 and look for inflationary fears. Because I sat on Mm -hmm. a stage, on a TV stage with David Stockman. You know who he is, right? Reagan's Uh, office office, uh, office management budget. One of these guys, like these third way type of guys. Um, Mm Mm-hmm who said that we are, he said the exact same thing that you did um, almost 10 years ago in the wake of uh, the the QE, uh, the quantitative easing one, that we were going to head for Weimar, and guess what happened? Nothing. Trillions of dollars we gave the banks, and then we just 
burnt mm-hmm. it off. Just said, fine, keep it. We just trade the money back and what forth. What happens? What happens when we can't control the interest rate? We can control the interest rate. The Federal Reserve controls the interest rates. Well, the Federal Reserve can set a nominal interbank rate. What happens when the bond market refuses to respect the interest rate? What are they going to do? Where are these bond Where are these bondholders going to go? Um, Venezuela, probably either the euro or the ren maybe. I'm sorry, the euro. Are you aware of what's going on right mm-hmm. now uh, in Europe? I am. Okay. So you think that you think that the bondholders are going to say? At what point do you anticipate this happening? I mean, if, I don't you, know. if what you're it's, saying it's but, advancing because the president's well, throwing us into a trade war with a bunch of tariffs. Well, wait a second. So you know, our but foreign, Nicholas, your our foreign is, buyers are your th- shifting to other countries. Your theory. When they shift to other countries, they're going to start marking the market in different currencies that are not the dollar, right. which then lowers our buying power. I had these same conversation with people to control the interest rates. ten years ago. Nicholas, um, okay. let me ask you this. How much are uh, bonds worth now? What are, what are the interest rates that we're having to pay to, to, to borrow money now? Are they, have they skyrocketed? I mean, the, the T-bill rate, I think, is down into the like 2%. It's now, tiny. It's, are these bond are these bond uh, buyers complete idiots? Because if what you're saying is the case, if we've got this massive debt that is going to challenge us, and 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 we can actually talk about how expensive uh, Medicare for all will be, because it's it's not nearly going to be as expensive, I think, as you anticipate. But if it was the case that these bondholders were worried about it, wouldn't the interest rates go up according to your theory? Well. Sort of the bond the bond price goes down to reflect the risk, but right yes uh, the 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 perceived or the felt interest rates through the economy would go up right and why isn't that happening according to your theory? Well, it's not happening in court because of the stuff that you're talking about as the government continues to ignore the debt ceiling and print more money or issue more bonds and keep selling more debt, it pumps money into the economy, which then allows them to keep the interest rates low. You can do that for a long time. I mean, when you can, can you drink stop for doing a long that? time and not when do you have, have a hangover? To, when do you have to stop? Until you stop drinking, right? But when do you have to stop? To, why should we stop drinking? I, I would say take a look at what happened to Argentina. We're not Argentina. We have control I'm over. That, we have control yeah. over our currency. We're not tied to uh, any one uh, natural resource to provide our. But is that permanent? Is the currency control permanent, where we can issue sovereign debt and people will want to buy I it? I don't know. Is that I, a I mean, situation? I have a feeling uh, climate change is going to be a much bigger problem than, uh, than our uh, preeminence as a currency uh, failing is going to be, particularly well, as I we, look around. Put- now, bondholders agree with me, because otherwise you would see a commensurate rise in what they require to take on more risk. But they don't. So who are you going to believe? The people who are actually in the business of buying U.S. debt or you? But let's change for you a know, let's, let's change for a second. Yeah, let's for a moment. shift. Yeah, let's shift. Um, Medicare for all, you're afraid that it's going to cost how much? I, it's going to cost a lot. I mean, gov- when you have a single payer for a service, you have no competition in that market, which is Correct. going to raise the cost of provisioning the care. You're, um, you get some economies of scale for being a large buyer, but there's no competitive pressure to do anything better. Are you aware of the term of monopsony? Yes, I'm aware of the term of monopsony. Okay. Explain to people what that is. A monopsony is when you have one buyer of a, a good or a service in the market. So only one one group or organization is the the sole buyer of the product. Correct. And what does that buyer that buyer have? What kind of power do they have in terms of of the cost of things? Theoretically, they have the power to set what price they will pay because they're the only buyer. The 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 normal supply and demand stuff doesn't work exactly right. What happens instead is you have a steep drop from a willingness to provide the service to this single buyer at a dictated price to I'm not willing to even participate in the market anymore because the single buyer won't pay me enough. So what you end up happening is 
you don't the problem you get with a single payer system so wait uh, let me just explain to people sca- shortages and scarcity because okay. if the single buyer says I, my price is going to be so low doctors get out of the market or right. okay so, so just to be clear gets out of the market just to be clear a single payer system will actually uh, can actually control costs more but the danger is that they'll control costs in such a way that it won't be profitable enough for doctors to be doctors, right? That's what you're suggesting. Right. So the look real at danger, Canada or the National Health Service in Britain, and you see some of these effects. The National Health Service in Britain where, is like the VA. Right. You're conflating two different things, because because the National uh, Health Service is actually it, it, all the but doctors. But if you say Medicare for all, then it, it isn't. No. Right. You, if, if you if Nicholas, you, you're making a very very severe error of a category error okay in, in, help, in, help me understand okay in britain under the uh the national health service if you're a doctor your check your check you're an employee of the government everyone around right. you is an employee of the government in right. in uh, a single payer healthcare system you the doctors all work for either the hospital or themselves, but they get checks from the insurance company. In this instance, the insurance company is the U.S. government. So why would you keep the insurance model if you're trying to move to a single-payer system? I think I maybe mean, that's ultimately... what Obama did, which was stupid. You managed to take the worst of big health insurance companies, you know, padding their bills and third-party payer and all of the disincentives there, and combine it with a mandate that, you know, forced everybody to buy this crappy product. Um, you know, it's the worst of both worlds. Well, Any the product got better. health economist will tell you that. The product this got, well, sucks. that's not true. I've talked to a lot of health economists. Um, but the product got better because of, of, um, of basically a minimum standard for what constituted health insurance. I would agree with you. It was a bad way. The product we got should, worse. We Man. shouldn't subsidize. As a business owner who had to buy health insurance for my employees, the product got significantly worse to the point where the only coverage that was affordable had such a high deductible that it wasn't really insurance at all for anything other than catastrophic care, and that's why it was so unpopular. You had no rescission. The insurance companies well, sold crappy it's, insurance. It's more and popular. Had to buy it. It's actually got a fifty percent, more than fifty percent approval rating now. But the, but that but putting that aside for a moment. Uh, we know that there's no such thing as rescission anymore. There's no lifetime caps. We know that right. you can't be that 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 all insure. makes it actual. That's insurance. why the insurers get out of the market. That's why I lost my insurer from year to year. Because Indeed, the insurer right. Which is why you and I agree on this. The only good part about that was the expansion of Medicaid. This is why we need to go to a single payer. And then your fear is we're going to have doctors who are going to get out of the uh, the business because it's not going to be profitable there, enough for them.